Over the years, there have been countless games that never made their way to a Western audience, and the Game Boy Advance was no absentee to this trend. From Mother 3 to Fire Emblem 6, some of the system's greatest offerings were sadly missed by people who were living outside of Japan for many years due to the lack of localization. In 2006, a curious set of seven GBA games were released in Japan on two different dates. Dubbed the Bit Generation series, these experimental titles oozed intrigue from the strange box design to the visual presentation of the actual games. Though the American market never got a glimpse of these titles in GBA cartridge form, despite some rumors about their localized title as Digilux, as well as some official stickers in Super Smash Bros. Brawl on the Wii, Eventually, some of these would see release as DSiWare and WiiWare adaptations under the art style umbrella. So without further ado, let's dive into these seven quirky cartridges and see if any value can be taken from them. Starting in alphabetical order, our first cartridge is called Boundish, and it's a collection of four Pong-inspired minigames with a bonus unrelated game tacked on. You'll notice fairly quickly when opening this game that the soundtrack is chiptune inspired, but at times some of the audio tracks resemble nails on a chalkboard. If you have the physical cart, you can play these games in multiplayer either with a friend who has another copy of the same cart, or using the download play feature to share the gameplay with another system from a single cart. The first game here is called Pool Flower, and to me it really seems like the least inspired of the bunch. It's your typical Pong game, but players can move in 8 directions instead of just on a vertical line. If you hit the ball into one of the floating spheres, it will change into your player's color, but really all that seems to do is just briefly increase the velocity of your hit ball. Next we have Power Slider, a hockey-inspired Pong clone where players rotate around their own circular axis to deflect a puck back and forth using a curved paddle. I enjoyed this one a fair bit. Uh, it seems more challenging than your average Pong clone, but there really is not much replay value once you've got a few rounds under your belt. Wild Go Round is quite similar to the previous game, where players again rotate around a circular axis to deflect a ball towards their opponent, but the gimmick here seems to be that the ball and play field rotate as the record spins around the turntable. Instead of being hit in a linear pathway, the ball will curve with the rotation of the record, adding a fair bit of unpredictability and challenge to the otherwise simplistic gameplay. Human League is where things start to get kinda weird. Two teams of what appear to be stick figures tied up with their limbs stretched outward dangle around the playfield like spiders to deflect the incoming ball. I'm curious to see what inspired someone to make a game like this. The implication of what's going on here is disturbing to say the least. Maybe it's like one of those inkblot tests, and they're really just stick figures with outrageously long limbs or something completely different. Either way, it doesn't quite sit well with me, and I'd be interested to see what you think about it. Finally, let's take a look at the extra bundle minigame that is mostly unrelated to Pong, titled Box Juggling. The name is self-explanatory, as your player character with 90 degree angled arms deflects boxes into the air as if he were juggling. At first, it seems a little too easy, but the game adds another box for every 50 that you deflect, and there are sporadic events like bonus boxes that change things up. The combination of simple gameplay and serene music adds up to a pretty mesmerizing experience, but if I'm being honest, there were Flash games in 2006 that probably did this concept better.
So that was the first cartridge. Now let's take a look at Caloris. This is a match three puzzle game with an alluring style and dreamy sound effects. And though it takes a little bit of trial and error to get used to the gameplay, it should quickly become one of your favorite puzzle games on the GBA. Instead of swapping tiles like in Bejeweled, you swap the color of a single tile to make linear patterns of colors in order to clear parts of the board. As you complete each level, the color schemes begin to change, the boards increase in size, and you start to see special blocks that provide benefits or hindrances to your puzzle solving endeavors. Instead of reaching a high score, your goal is to fill the meter at the top of the screen by completing linear patterns as quickly as possible. I'm sad that this cart only stayed in Japan as I really would have enjoyed playing it back in the day, since there just isn't much that you can compare it to on the GBA. Next up is Dial Hex, a similar grid-based puzzle game with unique mechanics. If you've played puzzle games like Hexic on the PC and Xbox 360, this might feel similar to you. But this is another game that the GBA's library just wouldn't be able to find a match for. This time, we rotate triangular pieces into little hexagons amidst a larger hexagon-shaped grid. Gravity plays a role in the gameplay as pieces will fall into empty places that you've rotated into, and pieces will continually fall from the sky to fill up the board. You must be quick to complete hexagonal shapes, as you'll lose if the board fills up all the way, but there are some special triangles that appear from time to time to help clear out the board if you match them into a shape. I'm again blown away by the sound design. The music is calming and it begins to ramp up alongside the gameplay as more colors are introduced. Overall, I'm very impressed with this game. If you can't manage to get your hands on an imported cartridge, it's also been released as a WiiWare game under the name Rotohex. Digidrive is a bizarre traffic control game, and the only title in this line to not be developed by Dev Team Skip. This project was manned by Q Games, the same dev studio that would later go on to develop the Pixel Junk games. It was also the only title from this series to be ported to DSiWare, and it kept the same moniker for that release. The goal of this game is to propel this circular object on the right side of the screen as far as possible. For some reason, this is accomplished by directing these arrow-like vehicles into four different lanes, filling up each to gain the largest amount of momentum. At times, the gameplay will take an unexpected turn and force you to think on your feet. I don't think I fully grasp the point of this game while playing, but I do appreciate the support for multiplayer and download play, as well as the ability to customize the music and visual presentation. Dot Stream is a top-down racing game where colored lines zoom along a side-scrolling course, rife with obstacles and alternating pathways. Your ideal game plan is to turn as few times as possible since your forward speed diminishes when correcting course, and that can allow other racers to gain a key advantage over you. The game supports single race mode if you need to learn the basics and a Grand Prix mode when you want to put your skills to the test. As you race more of these events, there are more tracks that you can unlock to change up the gameplay. This is a pretty game to look at, but to me, it feels like it has more style than substance. If you do enjoy Dot Stream, there is an even trippier version of this game on WiiWare called Light Tracks. Orbital is easily my least favorite of these games. It plays lethargically slow, and the gameplay was just not entertaining for me. You play as some kind of celestial body, and you are continuously roped into different gravitational pulls in each galaxy that you visit. Precise pressing of the A and B buttons allows you to use momentum to break free from gravity and drift off into space. 
That description might sound pretty cool, but it just doesn't translate into an enjoyable game experience. I'd recommend this for players who are looking for a combination of an emphasis on precision and a relaxing aesthetic, but it's likely not cut out for a wider audience. There is also a way more enjoyable adaptation of this concept through WiiWare titled Orbient, so don't waste your time here. Our last game could be the most bizarre of the whole collection. Sound Voyager is an experimental rhythm game that has little focus on precision and more on just enjoying the ride. The music, visuals, and gameplay synchronize in a way that I've never seen before in a video game. When you start out in a level, you collect green orbs or dodge red ones, but eventually they'll start to fade into black and all of a sudden you have to rely on audio and visual cues to complete the rest of the level. The backgrounds light up with color and the music ramps up when you're near the area that you're supposed to be, and though sometimes it feels like you're flying blind, eventually you will come across the right pathway. At times, it seems like this game is some form of hypnosis, but I suppose that's not unlike others in the series. Since there are no directions, you'll have to learn what the conditions of each level are on your own through trial and error, and there are quite a few levels to slog through here. I definitely enjoyed this one, and though you can't find this game on any other system, I'd say it's worth near the $30 asking price online. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this examination of the Bit Generation series on GBA. Some of these games were really cool, others eh, not so much. But overall, I would say this is a group of games definitely worth buying if you are a GBA collector. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. I'm planning quite a bit more GBA content, so be sure to stay tuned. Thanks again, and I will see you all next time.